Welcome back to the Aussie Shed, ladies and gentlemen. By popular request, the drill to mill conversion. Oh, hang on. What's that? That's not the drill. That's the drill. So there it is, ladies and gentlemen, in all its glory. My mill converted drill press. Which begs the question, can you actually turn a drill press into a mill? And the short answer is, of course, unless you have very special magic powers, a big fat no. But is it possible to set up a drill press in such a way that it can handle some light milling operations, which a lot of the time is all you need? And the answer to that is a big fat yes. And why is that so? Well, the secret word here is stiffness. And as any gentleman of my age will tell you, without stiffness, the entire operation is a complete waste of time. Therefore, the bigger and heavier the setup that you begin with, the easier it's gonna be to increase that stiffness. The forces that you will be trying to combat by undertaking any milling on your drill press are mainly reactionary forces. As in, the cutter is constantly trying to push the work away from it, and the drill press is trying to keep it in position. And if your machine can't successfully resist that force, then the cutter will jump or chatter and probably break. The harder the material that you're trying to mill, and the more depth of cut you're trying to achieve with each pass, the more this amplifies the situation and the stiffer your setup needs to be. It's no coincidence, ladies and gentlemen, that a mill is generally just a great big lump of cast iron. And a drill press, as you know, is not. And herein lies one of the biggest problems. How do I get my pissy drill press to act like a big lump of cast iron? The short answer is, you have to evaluate everything. Look for every area of weakness on your drill press. Everything that moves, work out why it moves and work out how, do you, how you can combat that. Uh, with bracing and adding mass wherever you need to. The shining example that you see here before you today, folks, it's an old Taiwanese drill press that I've had for about 25 years. Uh, it was a fairly inexpensive unit in its day, but it was also of reasonable quality. I purchased this particular drill press uh, used at a flea market. It was probably five to 10 years old at the time. The biggest feature it had on it when I bought it was it has a table lift which uh, over time I've found to be a really great thing to have. Okie dokie, so where do we start? Well, step one, of course, is to bolt this thing down to the bench properly. And I really mean properly, and I can't stress enough how important that is. Without fixing the thing down, uh, you're just, you're not gonna get anywhere. The next thing you really need to consider is bracing. As you can see here, the head assembly of the drill press is braced uh, it's actually braced back to the, uh, to the structure of my bench over here. Uh, the bench actually goes up and overhead. There are over, overhead shelves all in steel as well. Bracing the, the head assembly of this particular drill press was actually a really big leap forward um, for me. Uh, previously to bracing the head, I would really struggle to do any work in steel, mild steel, etc. Uh, aluminium wasn't too bad, but the extra force that uh, you were trying to control when doing anything in steel, uh, it was a real problem. And putting that brace on the head, uh, on the head assembly, made a really, really big difference. I'm actually planning on revising this brace. I'll just tilt the camera up a tad here. You can see there's a steel beam that runs across over the top of the drill press here that's just supporting another shelf. Um, I'm actually planning on dropping a support down because I have noticed that when the going gets tough, the head assembly of the drill press actually starts to pulsate up and down. And uh, I figure by bracing it uh, to the top, uh, it should resolve a lot of that issue. A lot of the movement of the head assembly, I can actually trace back to uh, this joint here where the base meets the column. Now, this area flexes quite a bit. I've got uh, quite heavy bolts running through to the bench. The entire area underneath this ply 
is uh, is heavily braced with 50 by 50 thick wall steel tube. Um, and this is bolted down through it with spaces. And you can see there's shims here and there to try and correct everything wherever I can uh, to try and uh, take this flex out. But this flex that happens around this area here is still a problem for me. Once I uh, sort that out, short of making a new base out of a giant lump of something or other, uh, it's going to be a little bit tricky, but I'm sure there are ways to be able to do that. The threaded rods here on the table work twofold. Uh, firstly, they, uh, when the nuts are all clamped down together, it significantly braces the table up and helps take uh, a lot of the load. And also what it allows you to do is to finally adjust the, uh, the tilt of the table and also the fore and aft movement of the table because the table is held back to the column uh, and it also clamps up once you get the height set. But by adjusting these, you can, you can tune that angle. And what that does, that allows you to get your workpiece or vice or whatever you've got um, on the table completely square off the cutter, which is really, really important. How I generally achieve this is with using uh, small machinist squares that I can sit uh, either on the workpiece or on my vise. Uh, it's quite precise and the surfaces are quite flat and square. So by holding your square against the cutter and dropping it down onto your vise or the workpiece, you can eyeball it and see whether it needs to go up or down on one side and then for, forwards and backwards it's the same thing just move the precision square to the front or the back have a look if there's any light underneath the square and how it's sitting and you know maybe take both up or both down depending on what you have to do this will uh, dramatically improve the surface finish of what you're trying to machine compared to if you don't do it and you're cutting you know if, if your work's going through on a slight angle I have also used the digital angle meter for this, but using the digital angle meter relies on knowing that the, the quill of your drill press is absolutely perpendicular in every direction uh, because it's no good sitting the angle meter on your workpiece and getting it zeroed out if the quill is not sitting uh, exactly right. My drill press is actually sitting pretty good here. That's why when I was talking about the the base, uh, you could see there were shims under there. That was all an attempt to get the machine uh, completely plumb and uh, perpendicular in every direction uh, so that I could in fact then use the digital angle meter on particular things. Most of the time I use the machinist squares, but occasionally I have to use the digital angle meter depending on what I'm doing. Sometimes I just can't get a square set up on it. You can see how I've attached the threaded rod to the underside of the table. This is just simply a piece of angle that I've welded on and drilled a couple of holes in. This allows me uh, like minor and fine adjustment of the top if I need to and where the threaded rods go down through the bench. Uh, they actually extend quite a fair way down so they can be uh, dropped right down because the top of this rod here will actually interfere with the XY table uh, if it's lowered down so you need to be able to drop uh, the threaded rod down to a point where it doesn't interfere or extend it up to a point where you can still use it with the uh, with everything adjusted up to a really high position. Another thing that you really need to be certain of is that there's no play in the uh, the quill or the spindle. I would suggest replacing the bearings if, the, if, it's, if it's an old machine uh, and if it's a new machine just thoroughly go over it and make sure there is no movement. If you do have any movement in this area, you have to fix it uh, prior to undertaking this because you will be in a position where no matter what you do, you will not be able to get this to work because any movement is absolutely critical. You have to have absolutely no movement at all. Uh, otherwise, you're just not gonna be able to mill squat. I have seen people on YouTube with so-called converted drill presses who uh, will demonstrate by, you know, knocking a couple of mil off a piece of plastic or something like big deal that's really not any kind of an achievement uh, certainly nothing to be proud of and be making a video about depth adjustment is also critical you really need to be able to lock the cool depth in both directions up and down and also to be capable of fine adjustment 
even fine depth of cut adjustments uh, what you're looking to be able to achieve here this particular drill press had a depth stop built into the hand feed lever but it was completely useless for anything bar making maybe swiss cheese due to the amount of slop in the uh in the rack and pinion mechanism i'll just quickly demonstrate that uh, if i bring that down slightly and lock it you can see it's all well and good but you can actually move the quill up and down due to the slop in the rack and pinion and most rack and pinion mechanisms are going to be like this on 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 drill presses so a lock in this position yeah great for doing nothing but what you really need is a um is a a lock that will actually lock the quill and you can see how i got around this by making a collar that clamps to the quill if you're not confident in making a collar like this uh, there are plenty of guys out there that you can find on uh, ebay for example that sell steel offcuts that will uh, machine out the center of a, uh, a piece of round stock for an additional fee and from there on and from there on it's pretty simple to finish it's just a matter of putting a slot in it uh, a thread so that it'll squeeze together and uh, making some you know threaded holes to mount stuff on it this collar then gave me something solid that i could mount a depth lock to and also a depth gauge as you can see the uh, the z-axis uh, depth gauge is just a cut up vernier that i've then mounted onto the uh, the head assembly uh, i chose that particular vernier because it has quite a large display it is stainless but uh, it did drill very easily and uh, it, it's actually quite a godsend it's it, once again it's an area that uh, creates great improvement uh, it simply mounts one end to the collar and then the other end just mounts onto the uh, the head assembly i did actually disassemble this vernier before i mounted it well i i had to disassemble it to cut it all down and part of that was due to the fact that it was it was uh, quite gnarly to operate it didn't run very smoothly uh it was just a little bit average which is typical because basically it's a cheaply made piece of crap but you get what you pay for make no bones about that you could cut up a minute a Mitch Toyo, but realistically who's going to do that when this will do the job having a drill press with a removable spindle mt2 mt3 taper is in my opinion a must collar chucks in either format can be had very cheaply on ebay or some of the other usual suspects in my opinion collar chucks are the balls for holding end mills in your drill press now here we get to a major safety issue as most of you probably know the quill of a milling machine is threaded and locked into the machine and a drill press quill isn't now this is a big problem because the quill is now facing more lateral forces a bit of vibration can often cause it to drop out of the taper if you're milling when this happens it could be catastrophic for the workpiece the milling cutter and the operator of the machine if shit comes flying out at you my solution to this problem was to make a collar which locks the spindle insert into the spindle nose and that is the collar there so the spindle nose actually comes out slightly here and there's a little exposed section of the taper uh, that this locks together with it's very simple and so far very successful it's merely a piece of 6061 round stock with a hole either side to match the spindle insert diameter on one side and the spindle nose diameter on the other then there are three four millimeter grub screws locking either side to the respective part i've used this setup like this for many years with no dropouts i've also tested it without the collar and the spindle drops out often and i would no way be confident to use this setup without that collar it's also still quite easy with the collar in position to change back to a chuck and i use it with or without the collar in place uh, when i'm using the chuck simply because you've got the chuck and you're going to be drilling there really is no need for the collar the the taper won't drop out if it's constantly being forced up 
by the by the drilling process. So you can simply loosen these lower grub screws off uh, that are locking the collet insert to the holder and withdraw the holder in the normal way you would with a removal tool which I will do right now. So we'll just loosen these off Insert the taper removing tool, give it a little tap, and out she comes. That's simple. Then if you want to throw a chuck in, it's just simply a matter of putting it in position. No need to tighten up the grub screws because they're just simply not needed if it's, uh, if it's drilling. I'll just run that back up. I've replaced the original chuck that came with the machine, as you can see here. Uh, I've got a precision keyless chuck unit in it. It's much, much nicer to use. So if you've got a uh, an old drill press that comes with a, you know, a conventional style keyed chuck, a bit of a pain in the ass, you can't beat a nice new precision keyless chuck. Now, let's move on to the XY table. Now as far as the device goes for moving the workpiece around while you're uh, performing different processes on it, you can't beat a heavy cast iron XY table. Once again, the heavier something is, the harder the forces acting against it have to work to move it. Think back to a proper mill. Don't try to use a cheap XY drill vise. They're simply not up to the task. And even cheap alloy XY tables will let you down in this regard. Uh, you can see the unit I've got here. It's a cheap import. It's cast iron. It's been in service for around 10 years uh, and it's served me well. It's getting a little worn now and needs uh, either replacing or repairing. Uh, but that's something I'm going to probably look at in the near future. The issue is the lead screw nuts are worn and uh, they need replacing. It's a bit of a, a one-off uh, Acme thread on this particular XY table. Um, it just means I've got to either make something for it or replace it. I'll probably end up making something. You also need a fairly accurate milling vise. This type of milling vise is shit. It's not completely shit. It is usable to hold stuff in your drill press. Really, that's all it is. It's just a drill press vise. Uh, and for milling, it's pretty much completely useless. Uh, so what you can see here is the vise that I have. It's just a cheap import unit. It's cast iron. I've been super, super happy with it over the years, and it is once again a must have. You can see here I now have a rotary table sitting up on top of the uh, of the XY table here. Uh, I do sometimes use a rotary table on here. It's not a must have, but it is also something that uh, that's that's quite handy to have. This is a uh, an import vertex unit with a 125 mil three three jaw chuck, and uh, like I say, it is quite handy to have uh, at times. You will also and quite obviously need some sort of a clamp kit. You can see my clamp kit sitting over here on the wall. Uh, this will just allow you to clamp anything down to your XY table uh, in such a fashion that it's not gonna move and become dangerous when you do start milling stuff. There really is just no other way to properly secure things to the XY table. Okay, let's move on to spindle speed control. Uh, this drill was originally a 21 speed unit running three step pulleys up top. It was actually quite usable for milling, uh, but you just can't beat the ease and flexibility that a variable speed DC motor gives. This is a three horsepower, uh, 180 volt DC motor I pulled out of a treadmill off a roadside rubbish pickup pile, and it is absolutely fantastic. The motor controller that I'm running with it is something I knocked up myself. It's SCR based. It's made up from about 15 bucks worth of, of electronic components uh, off eBay. 
and it's been issue free now for many years. Uh, DC motors are also easily reversible with the addition of a simple switch, which is located up here. Uh, that's my forward and reverse switch. Uh, this opens up the ability for tapping with the drill press. Uh, it's been actually quite successful uh, for tapping with, but beware, it can be a tap breaker if you're not careful. Like anything like this that doesn't have a clutch built into it that has a lot of torque, uh, the operator has to be really careful or believe me, you will break taps. With the pulleys I'm running in it at the moment, uh, it has a low speed of about 80 RPM and a top speed of about 1800 RPM. Uh, it has bucket loads of torque even on the slower speed and uh, believe me, I've got the broken taps to prove it. I'll just zoom in up top again. So RPM monitoring is achieved via a cheap Hall Effect sensor, digital gauge combo. Uh, you can see up here, there is, there's the Hall Effect sensor. It's just drilled in through the, uh, the top cover of the um, drill press. And there's a magnet mounted on the spindle drive pulley that, uh, that, that the sensor picks up on. It's really great. Um, my only issue is it, with it is it, it does have a little bit of lag. It, it takes a second or so to, um, before it changes, uh, but it is just fabulous. You can see this is the, uh, this is the potentiometer. Starts the machine. Once you've turned it on, the green light's on, you then have power to the potentiometer. Um, you can see that there, that's about 100 RPM it's running at. You can get it even slower. Like I said before, about 80 or so. Uh, 70. And, you know, and up she goes. There is a flywheel on the bottom of this treadmill motor that I'm running with it at the moment. I've run it with and without the flywheel. Uh, it seems to help a little bit as far as adding mass it's a, a particularly, I find the um, flywheel that's on there is particularly handy uh, when you're using a hole saw cutter. It just uh, adds more torque and puts more fight against the cutter. Um, you know, no big deal. As I say, it's reversible. You just flick it in a reverse. Goes the other way. You can actually use the forward reverse as an engine brake, uh, which I'll just demonstrate here. So I run it forward and then uh, hit reverse with the potentiometer turned off and it works like an engine brake. So you can quite easily forward and reverse, no problem at all, which is super handy for tapping. All of the modifications that I've actually performed on this drill press not only uh, allow you to do light milling with the machine, but they also transform the drill for general drilling work. Uh, with the unit as it stands here, it has absolutely no problem with large hole saws, large twist drills, annular cutters, etc. It is so good to be able to quickly drill accurate and repeatable holes in just about anything. It is just bloody great. So that's pretty much it, I think, for the overview. Uh, if you want to see the converted drill press in action, uh, I'll tack a little bit of video uh, onto the end of this uh, from the last video that I made was where, where I machined up a cast iron base plate for my uh, belt disc sander. And uh, other than that, if you want to see any more footage, just go back through my videos. Some of the mini lathe videos have footage of me using this machine to mill up uh, different mild steel plates, uh, etc. for the mini lathe. Uh, you can see it's, it's, it's quite successful. Uh, in the upcoming weeks, I will be tearing this unit apart. I have to move it slightly up the bench. And at that time, I will do some more in-depth videos on uh, all of the individual components, such as the locking collar, the quill collar, the depth adjustment, 
uh, this entire unit up top there, which is just a uh, you know a plastic enclosure which houses the uh, the DC motor controller, the light, the RPM gauge, the forward and reverse switch, and I will show you how to uh, build a reliable motor controller and basically duplicate this setup that I have here, uh, which is very very robust. I have been running it as I mentioned earlier in this configuration for quite a number of, number of years and it's just been great, no issues at all. So yep, more in-depth videos to come for now. That gives all you guys an overview of exactly what you've been looking at here and whether or not you think you can achieve the same thing, possibly even better. Uh, you know, it's not rocket science what I've done here. You just have to really think about what you're doing, look for movement, work out ways to eliminate it, follow those principles, and it'll just be a win for you. Like I say, it's really not possible to turn a drill press into an actual milling machine, but you can set up your drill press in such a way that you can achieve some light milling tasks with it, which in a home workshop situation like mine, that's all I need. As always, thanks for stopping by the Aussie Shed. Remember to like and subscribe. Always a pleasure having you here, and I'll catch you on the next one. See ya. There we go folks, it looks like the mighty drill press has saved us once again, there it is, very nice, very nice indeed.